Well, how you doing? Good morning. Glad you're here, uh, especially if you are newer to Cormdale, and especially if you would not consider yourself a Christian. Uh, I'm really glad you're here. I know there's been a lot of people over the past few months that I've met who are newer to our church community, and perhaps I haven't had the chance to meet you personally, but I uh, hope I will soon. I uh, hope you took advantage of what Mike said about connecting with our Connections team. Um, we really want to help you explore whatever questions you have, and, and one of my longings ever since the very beginning of Cormdale Church has been that this would be a place where um, you can sort of be at home even if you're sorting out what you think about God, about the church. Uh, that may mean that you're not yet a Christian and you're exploring uh, the claims of Jesus. It may mean that you are a Christian who still finds yourself skeptical and doubtful and confused and uncertain. And um, all of those categories are well represented here, and we love that you're here. And so I just want you to hear that from me. Uh, know that we're really glad you're here. And by the way, for those of you that are downstairs in the fellowship hall, uh, good to have you here. I know that sometimes it's hard to watch on a screen, so hope uh, you're enjoying yourselves and glad to have you here as well. Um, Having said all that, I think the series that we're in this month is probably going to resonate more fully um, for those of you who would consider yourselves Christians, those of you who love God and are trying to follow Jesus Christ faithfully. The reason for that is because this series is uh, called Good News for the Weary. What we're trying to do is just talk about the reality of spiritual weariness, the reality that walking with God can be hard and can be tiring. And that there are seasons in the life of the soul where you just feel like it's sort of exhausting. Now, all of us face a certain amount of weariness just because of our circumstances, right? And so the, the point of preaching this series now in our lives is that we're all feeling a sense of weariness because of COVID and because of political unrest and all the things that have gone on in the last year or so. That just makes all of us circumstantially weary. Um, but what I want to do is talk about the weariness of soul that lies underneath that. And that that surfaces for those of us who are trying to walk faithfully with God. And so last week we talked about the weariness of persistence. Um, the spiritual fatigue that comes with just hanging in there. When there's no revival, when there's no great moment of spiritual awakening, when there's no dramatic movement of God, but rather just the day in, day out journey of ordinary faith. If you missed that uh, sermon, you can go back and listen to it. Uh, this week, I want to continue in that theme by talking about the weariness of obedience. When Jesus Christ calls you to himself, he calls you to a life of obedience. And not only does he call you to that, but he sends his Holy Spirit to live in you so that you want to change and so that you actually have the power to change. So if you're familiar with the gospel message at all, you know that uh, what, the, what the Christian faith preaches is that there's a problem in the world and in us, and that that problem is called sin. Now, most people agree that there's something wrong with the world. The disagreement is over what is that? What do we need to fix it? And the Christian message says, hey, what's broken in you and what's broken in the world around you comes down to this problem of sin. And what we need is we need our sins to be forgiven. And we also need sin's power over us to be broken. Sin in the Bible is both personal and corporate. It's something that's wrong with within us, and it's something that's wrong in the world around us. And so the Bible describes the gospel message as the answer to the problem of sin, and it also describes coming to Jesus as this radical shift in our allegiance, in what we live for. So for instance, Colossians chapter 1 tells us this, that God rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. So, so notice this language is you've come out of one kingdom and been placed into another one. You left behind one ruler and one master and one way of doing things and you're now transferred into this new kingdom where Jesus is king and there's a new way of doing things. And so now living under the rule and reign of Jesus, we are called into a life of obedience to him. Now, um, for those of us who love God, that's an exciting and an exhilarating thing, but not, uh, not unsurprisingly, um, that's not the most popular message in the world. 
right? Uh, the message that there is a God who you're to submit to and a king who has authority over you. Uh, our culture particularly hates authority. We hate being told that there is a God and it's not me and that I have to do what someone else says. And so as you might expect, um, obedience is a challenge for us because there's something in us that resists that and there's something in the world around us that is quite resistant to that. Um, and so as you might expect, there are voices both inside and outside the church that downplay the Christian call to obedience to the fact that Jesus is Lord. So within the church, for instance, there's a point of view uh, that, that calls itself free grace, which, as I've said before, is actually neither free nor gracious. And these people say that to believe in Jesus is merely to affirm the facts of the gospel, and that if we introduce any notion of repentance or of change or of obedience, that we are somehow adding to the gospel. Well, that point of view is defeated by just a basic grasp of Christian theology, and, and so I'm not really going to spend any time talking about that. Uh, it's clear that the message of Jesus is quite different from that. So, so, but there are voices inside the church that say, hey, obedience, not a big deal. Likewise, there are voices outside the church that, that sort of downplay the call that Christianity makes to follow the Lord Jesus. So the voices of cultural progressivism continue to tell us that the teachings of Jesus are outdated, that we need to leave them behind, get on the right side of history. Um, and in fact, when it comes to the Bible's teachings about, for instance, social justice or economic flourishing or environmental stewardship, those are welcome. In fact, feel free to obey those. But man, when it comes to the Bible's teaching on sexual ethics or on gender or on family, that should be jettisoned. We need to move on from that. Well, despite all the attempts to minimize Jesus' call to obedience, the fact is that the core profession of New Testament Christianity can be summed up in these three words. Jesus is Lord. That is the message the apostles proclaimed. That is the message the church has professed throughout history. And that's what Christianity believes and holds to be true, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And because he's Lord, we don't get to ignore his word we don't get to edit his word. We don't get to revise his word. In fact, we're called to obey his word and, and to submit our lives to him and to his way that he wants us to live in the world. And that is where things get challenging and where things get tiring, right? Can we be honest that conforming your life to the way of Jesus is challenging and sometimes wearying, right? Right? Rosaria Butterfield came to faith in Jesus in her early 30s while she was a tenured professor of English at Syracuse University. She wrote this amazing spiritual memoir. It's called The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. You can find it out there at the book table if you're interested. Uh, she described herself at the moment of her conversion as a lesbian, a feminist, and a, a radical leftist. And here's how she describes her moment of conversion. Although grateful, I did not perceive conversion to be a blessing. It was a train wreck. When I became a Christian, I had to change everything. My life, my friends, my writing, my teaching, my advising, my clothes, my speech, my thoughts. I was tenured to a field that I could no longer work in. I was writing a book that I no longer believed in. I was flooded with doubts about my new life in Christ. Was I willing to suffer like Christ? Was I willing to be considered stupid by those who didn't know Jesus. I did not in any way want to share the hope that lies within me. I wanted to go back to bed and draw the covers over my head. Can you relate? Becoming a Christian is great, but it's also a train wreck. It reshapes every aspect of your life, and it calls for radical change. And, and for most of us, there are some areas of our lives that change quickly, where we feel momentum and progress, and just it's easy. And then there are other areas where the struggle is long and intense and tedious and where change is slow and difficult. And here's what happens for most of us is when we come to faith in Jesus, we start to see the momentum in those areas that change really fast. We're like, man, this is sweet. I'm changing. God is good. And then we hit the grind where it's like, and here's part of my character that apparently is resistant to this vaccine, right? Right? Like, it's just not, the gospel isn't working over here in this part of my life. And it starts to feel really wearying. And those tend to be the places where the weariness of obedience sets in. Where it starts to feel tiring and difficult to follow Jesus as Lord. Well, if you've ever felt that weariness, 
uh, I have good news for you. So have generations of Christians before you. Uh, this is well attested in church history. God knows that every one of us is going to hit the point where obedience gets tiring, where it feels wearying to continue to conform our lives to the way of Jesus. And, and he's spoken a word of grace, a word of good news, to encourage us when we face the weariness of obedience. And in, in a moment, we're going to look at that word together. Before we do, I want to pause and I want to ask you this question. Where right now are you feeling in your own journey the weariness of obedience? Where is that for you right now? Just get that place in your life clearly in your mind. Bring that forward, engage it, so that as we continue, this can be God's word to you in your weariness. So where for you does obedience to God feel difficult right now? Identify that place and then turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, if you have a Bible, I'd like you to open it. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, the, the text will be on the screen as well. And we're going to engage this section in the book of Hebrews where God speaks a word to our weariness. By the way, just to reiterate what I've said so far, uh, Hebrews 12 chapter 1 says, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So notice this language of setting aside sin, but also this language of endurance. It's, it's telling us, hey, this journey is going to take persistence. But let's focus in especially in verse 3. The text says, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary, there's our word, or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary, there's our word again, when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Quoting there from Proverbs chapter 3. So these verses are acknowledging the reality of weariness. They're naming it. The scriptures are saying this is a real thing. If you feel this, you're in good company. And these verses are also giving us good news for the weary. Good news in our weariness. And here's the first piece of that good news. Jesus died to break the power of sin. Jesus died to break the power of sin. Look at verse 4. In your struggle against sin... You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, which implies that there's someone who has. It's inviting you to reflect on what is this talking about? Oh, Jesus, right? Your struggle against sin is not the first struggle against sin. Your struggle against sin follows the pattern of Jesus' struggle against sin. And this verse is reminding you that his struggle against sin caused him to shed his blood. Jesus fought the adversary of sin all the way to the grave and defeated it through his death. So you are not the first to struggle against sin. And hear this, your struggle against sin isn't actually the one that matters most. There's one who has gone before you and has shed his blood and fought sin all the way to death. And what that means for you is you are not fighting a losing battle. On the contrary, the power of sin has already been defeated, and therefore you are fighting a defeated enemy, and that should give you great hope in the midst of your weariness. Is obedience tiring? Yes. But good news, Jesus has already defeated sin, so you're going to be on the right side of this struggle. You are fighting a winning battle, not a losing one. Now, notice the language of this verse. It says, in your struggle against sin. So, so hear that, right? You have your own struggle against sin that's specific to you, and yet also it's common to every Christian. This you is addressed to every Christian hearing these words. There's a common struggle that God's people are called into, and yet in your life, that struggle is going to take a shape that's particular to you based on who you are, your temperament, your story, the things that have shaped you and molded you in life. So, 
Here's what tends to happen for us. When we feel defeated and discouraged and weary in our struggle against sin, we tend to look for ways to excuse obedience, right? We try to find a way out where we can just not have to obey. And that usually sounds like this, at least in my mind, probably in yours as well. It sounds something like this. Hey, my struggle is unique. If you don't know my situation, you don't know what it's like for me, I know you got your own things, I'm sure they're hard, but they're not as hard as mine. My struggles are particularly difficult, and therefore I get a pass. Right? The writer of Hebrews, gently and yet firmly, is rebuking that way of thinking. The writer is asking every reader, hey, let me ask you a question. Has your obedience to God cost you your life yet? Are you still reading? Okay, so it hasn't cost you your life? Oh. Okay, well then, let's keep going. Right? You follow a Savior who is executed. His resistance to sin cost him his life. If it hasn't cost you that then, then you're still uh, not as far in as he is. Right? And listen, you've now been drafted into the resistance. He resisted sin in the ultimate way, and you've been drafted into that resistance. And so guess what? Your job is to fight. It's to keep battling. And you can do that because Jesus has already won the victory and because Jesus has given you his spirit. So now you actually do have power and capacity to continue that fight. John Owen, who wrote this great treatise on the mortification of sin uh, years and years ago, said, here's how you fight sin. You keep hacking away at it. It's like you keep laying the ax at the root of that tree and just keep swinging. And that's basically what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Hey, keep fighting. Keep struggling. Jesus has gone before you. Jesus has defeated sin. His resistance cost him his life. You shouldn't expect it to be any easier for you. You should expect it. It's going to be a fight, a struggle. Keep hacking away. So when you feel weary, consider him. Now again, when most of us feel weary in the struggle against sin, you know what we tend to do? We start looking at ourselves, right? And thinking about how hard it is for us and our particular challenges. And what this verse is saying is, no, 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 wrong direction. Look at Christ. Consider him. Don't look into yourself. Don't try to find strength and wisdom and resource in you. Look at Christ. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. Now, honestly, we modern Christians are not great at doing this. Um, let's, let me get a little nerdy with you for a minute. The word consider here in verse 3 is the Greek word analogizo. You probably recognize the second half of that word as very similar to the English word logic. It's where we get that word from. So it, it has the idea of considering, thinking about. And the prefix ana in Greek just means again. So this word literally means think about it again. Slow down, ponder, meditate on, think again about him, Christ. The scriptures are saying what you need to sustain you in your weariness is to slow down and think about Jesus. And look, we're just not good at this because we have short attention spans. We just digest information all day, every day, and so we really don't slow down to think about anything. We speed up and try to think about more things, right? And so Jesus and his death and his struggle against him is just a factor that's in the huge swath of information we're trying to take in, and it's in there, but it's mixed in with all kinds of other data that we're trying to think about. And the scriptures are saying, hey, slow down, consider Think on Christ. Consider the hostility he endured. Think about how he resisted all the way to death and keep the cross of Christ front and center in your thinking. Well, let me read you an excerpt from Fleming Rutledge's book on the crucifixion. She says, There have been many famous deaths in world history. You might think of John F. Kennedy or Marie Antoinette or Cleopatra. But we do not refer to the assassination, or the guillotining, or the poisoning. 
such references would be incomprehensible. The use of the term, the crucifixion, for the execution of Jesus, shows that it still retains a privileged status. This death, this execution, above and beyond all others, continues to have universal reverberations. There were many thousands of crucifixions in Roman times, but only the crucifixion of Jesus is remembered as having any significance at all, let alone world-transforming significance. Slow down and think about Jesus, and specifically, he who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. One of the reasons I like this quote from Fleming Rutledge is because you literally realize what she's doing is reflecting on the word the. She's saying, hey, when we talk about Jesus' death, we talk about the crucifixion. Kind of weird. Because we don't talk about the anything else, the assassination or the guillotining. or the, right? We, we talk about the crucifixion as though it's so singular and so unique that everybody knows what we're talking about. Huh. Interesting. She's doing here the very thing the writer of Hebrews is encouraging us to do, just thinking about, considering Christ and his death and what it means for history. So the first piece of good news we have here is that Jesus died to break the power of sin. So consider him. Set your gaze upon him. Keep your eyes and your affections on Jesus Ponder his death and resurrection so that, it says, you may not grow weary and faint-hearted. This is a prescription for weariness. This is telling us, hey, when you feel worn out and weighed down by the challenge of obedience, consider Christ. Here's the second piece of good news. It doesn't just say consider him. It also reminds us that in Christ, God has become your father. Look at Verse 5, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord loves the one, or the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So notice three times the repetition of the word son. Now, just to address nouns and pronouns here, I realize that. If you're a woman in this room and you're reading this, you're like, okay, well, that's cool, but I'm not a son. I'm a daughter. And I want you to embrace the reality that when the New Testament speaks of identity in Christ, the reason it uses the male pronoun and noun is because it's conceiving all of us as in Christ, the only begotten son. So there's a reason that sonship language particularly wants to focus on our connection to Christ. And so this encaptures all of us, sons, And daughters, whenever the Bible says you're a son, it's encouraging you to realize, oh, it means because I'm in Jesus. So sons and daughters, sisters in Christ, find yourself here in this exhortation. This is not speaking merely of men. What the scripture is doing here is reminding you that obedience takes on a whole different meaning in the context of a family. Are you weary of obeying? Probably. But remember, God's your father. You're in his family. And that makes it a little different, doesn't it? When you face the weariness of obedience, remember, God is not your employer. God is not your parole officer. God is not the school principal. God is your father. And think about how obedience works in a family compared to how it works in an organization. In an organization, rules exist to maintain order and to create predictable behavior. Your employer expects you to show up to work on time or at least to log on to your Zoom meeting on time. Why? Because that makes things work in the organization. If you don't do that, you're not fulfilling your obligations. In an organization, rules exist to maintain order. But in a family, in a family, rules exist to form character. God doesn't merely want you to play your role in his organization so the thing can go okay. God is a father who wants to shape your character. 
so that his sons and daughters reflect his image in the world and display his beauty and his glory to everyone around them. And that's a whole different thing, isn't it? If God wants us to obey him for the sake of training our character so that we become a certain kind of people, that's a whole different ballgame than just a God who wants to drop some rules on us so that we do what he wants. My mom and dad are usually here. They're not here this morning. I imagine they watched on the live stream at 9 a.m. Um, but I had the privilege of growing up in a God-fearing household where there was a healthy sense of authority, where mom and dad were doing the best they could to just try to model the authority that God expects in the home. And here's what I can tell you. I didn't always like the rules my mom and dad had, but I always knew that they were rooted in love. Like, I, I never doubted that mom and dad cared about the kind of person I was becoming and that they had a vision for the kind of person I should become. That they were trying to get me to become a certain kind of person, and that, that required them to expect certain things of me. That was clear. So look, I was a teenager like all of you. I still had my issues with the rules, and I thought some of them were dumb and ridiculous, but I knew deep down, these people love me. They're out for my good. Likewise, the writer of Hebrews says, you shouldn't be weary when God disciplines you and corrects you and reproves you. He does these things because he loves you. He's your father. He wants you to become a person of character. He has a vision in mind for who he wants you to become. And this is the journey that we're on together. In the context of a family, obedience takes on a whole different dynamic, doesn't it? Like in the context of a family, there's a dynamic of joy and freedom and grace. There's a, there's a fuller context, you might say, to the nature of what it means to obey. So my own kids, most of them are teenagers now, and we seek as best we can uh, in our failing and limited way to reflect the dynamic of God's authority in our home. So our kids have always been expected to obey. That, that's just the nature of things. And if you're a parent, you should expect your kids to obey. This is what God wants, is he wants you to expect your children to obey and submit to parental authority in the home. But there's also a sense of playfulness and joy and even sanctified sarcasm that makes that okay, that makes that work, that makes it feel Joyful and empowering rather than limiting and constraining. My son, Louis, uh, who's 17, recently downloaded the Soviet National Anthem on Spotify, and he likes to play it when I ask him to do the dishes. <laughs> this is his way of implying that I'm a communist dictator who'd be well at home in a totalitarian <laughs> regime. I'm okay with that. You know why? Because that kind of playfulness, that kind of joy is part of a healthy family, and he still does the dishes. <laughs> now, if he did that and didn't do the dishes, I would have issues with both, right? But I'm okay with a little bit of sarcasm and humor. That's what Christian obedience should be like as well. God is our Father. He's good and loving. He's magnanimous and generous. He loves us, and he's happy and joyful in how he carries his authority. And so there's a bond of affection and joy that makes all of this beautiful and good. Kids, don't go home and download that on Spotify. I'm going to get so many emails this week like, hey, why don't you keep your kids from doing that stuff? Because now my kids are going to do that. It'll be fine. Just laugh. Okay? <laughs> Too many of us relate to God as a rigid boss rather than as a loving father. The writer of Hebrews says, hey, here's what you have to remember. You're a son. You're a daughter. There's a familial context that's taking hold here. Yes, God disciplines you. God sends you through hard seasons. God walks with you through things that are wearying and tiring. God has expectations of you that can be sometimes challenging. And all of that is rooted in his fatherly care for you. You need to be reminded of the good news that God is your father. So, here's what we've said thus far. The call to Jesus is a call to obedience. The gospel invites us into this new kingdom where Jesus is Lord and King and where we realize we're bowing the knee to King Jesus and that means there's going to be a reshaping of our lives and our habits and our character. This is the nature of the gospel. And as you follow Jesus, you're going to face the weariness of obedience. 
But here's the good news for the weary. Jesus died to break the power of sin, and God has now become your Father. This is good news in our weariness, and it's given to us here, as it says, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Hey, you're going to face weariness, but don't let it weigh you down. Don't become faint-hearted. Don't give up in your struggle against sin. Why? Because Jesus has already broken the power of sin and because God has welcomed you into his family. So let's go back to the question we started with. Where right now in your life are you feeling the weariness of obedience? Where does it feel like what God is asking of you, what he's requiring of you, the way of Jesus as it manifests itself right now in your life, where does it feel like that's difficult? And in that place, I want to invite you to do three things. Number one, worship Jesus. Cast your mind to the cross. Think specifically of him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. Think about the the depth and fullness of his glorious resistance to sin and the victory he accomplished on behalf of his people. Worship him. Allow your struggles in obedience to be a place where you worship Christ more. Instead of being a place where you start to feel disheartened and discouraged, look to that as an opportunity to say, Jesus is glorious and good and wonderful. He's victorious in this area. So number one, worship Jesus. Number two, remember that God is your father. See his demands and call to you in this area as the call of a father who loves you and who knows what's best for you. And then third, renew your commitment to obedience. Right now this morning, renew your commitment to follow Jesus as Lord. To be committed to obeying him, even through the the highs and lows of the weariness and tiredness that that can bring with it. Say to him this morning, hey, I'm in. You've died for me. I live for you. Let's do this. Let's continue this journey. Listen, this is why God has given us one another. Like here in the language of fatherhood and the language of sons and daughters, here the language of community. We are the people of God, the family of God. You're never meant to walk in the way of Jesus alone and isolated. You're meant to walk in his ways together with one another. And part of the reason you're in a family is so you can receive encouragement and support. And when you need prayer, someone can come alongside you and say, let me pray for you in that area. And when you need accountability and someone to just kick you in the butt and say, keep going, someone can come alongside and say, hey, you're going to make it. We need one another for this. And this is why God has placed us not just into his family in isolation, but into his family with a whole community around us of people committed to this same journey together. And this is what the author of Hebrews wants to remind you of. Hey, hey, there's this great cloud of witnesses of saints who have already passed on, who are in heaven. They've already done their race, and now it's your race to run. So run it with endurance. Hang in there with one another. Set your eyes on Jesus and remind one another of Christ's death on your behalf and of the fact that you belong to God now and he's your father. So let's pray and ask the Spirit to remind us of those things as we prepare to continue in worship. Would you join me? Our Father in heaven, we just acknowledge um, that For most of us in this room, we we are submitted to you as Lord. We want to walk with you. And we thank you for those among us who are not yet submitted to you as Lord. And we want to invite them into the journey. But Father, we also acknowledge that this journey brings with it a certain kind of tiredness and weariness. It's possible for us to grow faint-hearted. And that's, in fact, why verses like this are in the Bible. So we're mindful this morning of the places where we feel weary, where obedience feels challenging, where the way of Jesus feels like it asks much of us? Would you meet us in those places this morning? Would you remind us of the beauty and glory of Jesus and of the fact that he has defeated sin and so we fight a winning battle? 
And then would you confirm to us this morning your love for us as our Father, that you're out for our good, that you've welcomed us into this wonderful family where there's grace, there's love, there's kindness, there's gentleness. You have a vision for who you want us to become, and you love us along the journey. So remind us of that this morning. As we come to the Lord's table, help us renew our commitment to you, our commitment to obedience. Meet us in the places where we are weak. Fill us up in the places where we lack. Um, Strengthen us in every way that we need it, that we might leave here this morning and walk faithfully with you today and this week for our good and for your glory. Amen.